Hello everyone, welcome to the first video of the science of Assassin's Creed. Most people that have played an Assassin's Creed game are familiar with the term genetic memory. It's a core concept of the games and essential to understanding the past-present setting duality. However, there is not that much information about how these genetic memories work, where they are exactly, and how they can be decoded, played, and visualized by or in a machine. Instead, this is left to the imagination of the player. This, of course, has allowed some people to make videos or documents about this topic, so this is not going to be the first one that you see. Nonetheless, I think I'm bringing new knowledge to light with my video, so sit back and have some fun. Roughly explained, a genetic memory is a memory coded by the DNA that is inherited from ancestors. Before jumping onto more complex things, I want to talk about a few other related terms that will help us understand it. I'll assume that people watching this video already know something about the Templar Assassin War as well as their motivations, so I won't be explaining any of that. So, first of all, what's an Animus? An Animus is a device created by the Templars that allows the user to experience a simulation of the genetic memories of the user's ancestors, or, like in more recent versions of the Animus, of someone else's ancestors. It uses the DNA of someone to decode the genetic memories of their ancestors and allows the user to go through a simulation in the past. The first attempts at making an Animus were in the 30s. This proto-animus, finalized in 1943, was based on the information retrieved from an apple of Eden by SS General and Templar, Guido Kramer. This animus prototype was designed by Abstergo Industries in 1976. And in 1978, the first animus device was actually built, beginning with it the field of DNA memory research. The first animus used was the version 1.0 in 1980. And since then, the animus has been improved to the point where nowadays a user can experience the memories of someone outside of the bloodline. Assuming that the memories of our ancestors are embedded in our DNA, this DNA must be decoded or cracked in order to decipher what's behind and get the information our ancestors collected throughout their conscious lives. This code was cracked by Dr. Warren Wittig at the end of the 70s, which allowed him to start the Animus project in 1985, a study where several test subjects would relieve the memories of their ancestors. After Wittig died in 2012, Sophia Rikin continued as the leader of this project. The goal of the Animus project was to find people with assassin heritage that had ancestors that were in contact with pieces of Eden. A spin-off of this project was the Surrogate Initiative, which was the first attempt of Abstergo at exploring genetic memories of an individual via a non-blood-related intermediate. Later on, after Desmond Miles escaped from the Abstergo facility in Rome where he was being held, several anime were used in the anime training program. This program involved the use of anime to train Templar agents by using the genetic memories of Italian Templars and individuals that lived during the Ottoman Empire. The Adamus was also used in a commercial framework at Abstergo Entertainment during the Sample 17 project. This project used the samples of Desmond Miles to try to find ancestors that gave good footage that could be exploited to mass-produce films or games that could be sold with the commercial Animus Omega. Finally, the Phoenix project was a study initially developed by Abstergo Industries in order to fully sequence the precursor triple helix genome. This project started after acquiring samples of John Standish, an individual known as a sage, who had 5-6% to of precursor DNA, which is very high compared to an average human being, which is around 0.0002 to 0.0005%. This could have allowed Abstergo to relieve the genetic memories of an Isu by using a piece of Eden called the Shroud of Eden, but unfortunately, it didn't have the ending that they expected after the instruments of the first wheel resurrected Juno. So, after that short introduction, let's dive a bit deeper into the functioning of the Animus. As seen on several installments of the Assassin's Creed franchise, an Animus generally consists, that we can see, of a chair or a seat where the subject can sit or lie down, a DNA sequencer or decoder, a potent virtual reality software and a nervous connection straight to the nervous system and, in the case of newer devices, an extra intravenous connection to the user. The nervous connection would not only allow the user to experience genetic memories, but also have a head at display present that orientates the user inside of the simulation. Thanks to the description of the Animus HR8, we know that before that device was built, there used to be an epidural connection involved, which means that all anime before that one needed that connection. This connection must be done at the level of the spine to reach a region called epidural space which protects the spinal cord and is full of connective and adipose tissue as well as blood vessels. The name epidural is probably very familiar to you since it's what doctors call the injection of anesthesia during parturition or labor. During this process, it's necessary to do it in the lumbar area, but for an animus it can be done somewhere else, as shown in the Assassin's Creed movie. Animus technology functions similarly as a simulator does. 
The consciousness taps into the genetic decoded DNA, allowing everything to appear to all the senses as three-dimensional. It's adaptive, so, as the memories unfold, what the user experiences begins to change subtly, making the exploration of a memory much more closely possible. To allow smooth experience, the animus creates areas outside the simulation. These are called memory corridors and the white room. The memory corridor functions like a loading screen, enabling a safe and efficient transition from one set of memories to another. At certain junctures, the user will experience a white room effect, which enables the user to focus carefully on information that will be conveyed. When things go very wrong, as seen during the events of Assassin's Creed Revelations, the Animus has a safe mode where the user may enter the Black Room or Animus Island, which is the original test program and consists of only basic physics and weather simulation. The Animus can likely produce an electrical stimulation of certain centers of the brain, allowing the user to experience their ancestor or someone else's genetic memories. The connection to the nervous system would allow the user to dive into the simulation, not only hearing and seeing, but also smelling and feeling what the ancestor felt, like shame, happiness, or even arousal, as described, for example, by Simon Hathaway, Charlotte de la Cruz, and Alia Han in Address Media. This might be caused, among other things, by rushes of hormones and neurotransmitters such as adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. This is probably what the genetic memory is, just a series of very specific electrical signals coded as DNA that, when they trigger the brain or the organs of the user, can elicit a very detailed response, such as the visualization of the past or feelings of an ancestor. The footage captured by the Animus user can be analyzed in real time by a technician that also monitors the proper functioning of the machine. The simulation can be modified from the outside as shown during Animus sessions of Desmond Miles or Lila Hassan, where people monitoring them were able to pinpoint or highlight locations and give extra information. The simulation has also been known to be tampered with by Clay Kaxmatic, also called Subject 16. Clay created a construct of himself instead of the Animus, hence the memory core, by hacking it during the night and splitting himself into pieces and scattering them throughout the simulation of Ezio Auditore's life, of whom he was a descendant. As mentioned before, in the more recent HR8 version of the Animus, a hematological link is used instead of an epidural connection, as it was the case of all their Animus versions. In this case, the Animus sequences the information stored in the user's red blood cells and transmits directly the data to every organ instead of only the brain, which interprets the simulation as being real. The cerebral transmitter is still necessary for the user to be able to see the scene, but it's not as invasive as before. It's important here to note that DNA sequencing from erythrocytes or mature red blood cells of humans is not possible due to the lack of nucleus, nucleic acid, and organelles in this type of cells. In real life, what researchers use are white blood cells. Erythrocytes don't just pop up from nowhere. They are formed from precursor cells in a process called erythropoiesis. Reticulocytes, for example, represent 1% of all red blood cells in the human body, and they are the last phase of red blood cells before the maturation to erythrocytes. They don't have a nucleus, but they do contain RNA and organelles, and they can even be stained and observed under the microscope. However, I really don't think that RNA is enough to give information about genetic memories. All blood cells that come before reticulocytes during the erythropoiesis do have a nucleus, but they appear in much lower concentrations since they are stem cells. They are present exclusively in the bone marrow. Ultimately, this could be the option that Absurgo uses since we're talking about a company with very advanced tech and that in one instance, Dr. Alvaro Gramatica used bone marrow from Elijah, Desmond's son and Sage, to mix it with the Shroud of Eden in order to produce a body for Juno. If we assume that the animus is capable of triggering physiological processes, and that the amount of time a person can stay in this last version of the animus is relatively long, then it's not weird that a dialysis unit is necessary. A dialysis machine is used in hospitals to clear waste products and excess molecules from the blood. These molecules usually would be excreted with the urine, but when there's kidney damage or failure, they are not filtered and stay in the circulation. Since the user is experiencing someone else's genetic memories down to the molecular level, then everything about the ancestor and the animus user will be synchronized. This is the famous synchronization that's mentioned throughout all games. It's necessary that the user and the ancestor are in complete synchronization to avoid health-related problems that go from vomiting, headache, and consequent expulsion from the simulation to brain damage and death. In Layla's personal files, we can find the Animus guide, and in it, we can see the image of her portal Animus HR8, and some of the parts, one of them being the dialysis unit we mentioned, and another, the cerebral transmitter, which looks like it sends electrical impulses into the brain of the user. This extraneural transmitter is also mentioned after the calibration of the Animus Omega. 
It's also an interesting fact that Leila uses cyclosporine while using the animus. This medication is an immunosuppressant commonly used during transplant treatment to stop the organ from being rejected by the patient's immune system, since despite compatibility, the body still considers the new organ as a foreign object. As mentioned by Dr. Diana Giri in 2017, the animus can reject the person, in this case, Leila, and affect their organs, for example, the kidneys. Since Leila is the one taking the immunosuppressants instead of taking the animus to avoid this issue, we have to assume that her body itself is having a connection problem with the animus due to an excessive response of her immune system. Dialysis is also necessary during long-term administration of an immunosuppressant like cyclosporine since it has a potential nephrotoxic effect, or in other words, it can damage the kidneys. Now, into the tricky part. How is the DNA read by the animus? Simplified, DNA sequences are made of biomolecules called nucleotides, which contain one of four distinct nitrogenous bases, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. The different order of these nucleotides in a sequence will determine the observable traits of each individual, as well as contain the information of all processes and functions of living organisms. In humans, the DNA is not only one string of nucleotides. It appears as a double helix where each nucleotide is paired with a complementary one. So that would be adenine with thymine and cytosine with guanine. Each of these bound units is called a base pair. In a single DNA strand, these nucleotides are bound to each other via a chemical group called phosphate group. Molecules called pentose sugars are the ones in charge of establishing the backbone of the whole DNA molecule. Here, you can see a fragment of the actual genetic sequence corresponding to the gene oxytocin neurofysin 1 prepropeptide, or OXT, which encodes a precursor protein that will be processed to produce oxytocin, a hormone that participates in smooth muscle contraction during parturition and lactation, as well as in sexual and maternal behavior. So, how can a machine know the order of these nucleotides? Well, several sequencing techniques have been developed in real life to sequence DNA. Sadly, none of them are mentioned in any of the Abstergo industry files. Overall, the main system nowadays is next-generation sequencing. With this technique, DNA sequencers can sequence millions of DNA fragments simultaneously. The safest assumption is that the sequencing technology of the animus is based on next-generation sequencing. There are many different platforms available that use different approaches, but I'll roughly explain it using the Illumina technology as an example, since it's one of the most widely used. It uses something called sequencing by synthesis. There are several steps involved, sample preparation, cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis. For the sake of the viewer's sanity, I'll only cover a fraction of the sequencing process. Now, imagine you have one single strand of DNA in a solution together with primers and fluorescently labeled nucleotides. A primer is a molecule that binds to a specific section of DNA thanks to the complementarity of their nucleotides. A complementary sequence to GG, AT, and so on would be CC, TA, and so on. And they could bind to each other. Once the primer is bound to the strand of DNA, the elongation of said strand of DNA would be possible. Since the only nucleotides present are labeled with a fluorescent compound, every time one molecule binds to the DNA strand we had in the beginning, of course based on the sequence of the template, it will emit a signal that is read by the sequencing device when the fluorophore breaks apart from the nucleotide. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, lets the device know which was the bound nucleotide. In the end, you will have a list of each of the nucleotides of the DNA strand exactly in the order that they bound. The human DNA consists of 25 different DNA molecules that I won't get into, and two physically separated genomes, a genome being all genetic information of an individual, a complex nuclear genome that contains the vast majority of our genes found in our chromosomes, and a very simple mitochondrial genome with just 37 genes found exclusively in the cell organelle known as the mitochondrion, which is involved in processes of aerobic respiration, essential for the production of energy for the cells. The human nuclear genome is in a form called chromatin, where not only DNA is present, but also RNA and proteins, among others. This chromatin can be divided into euchromatin and heterochromatin. Euchromatin is an active form of DNA, it appears less condensed, and it packs a very high concentration of genes in it. Heterochromatin, on the other hand, appears more condensed and is considered inactive. This type of chromatin can be further divided into facultative and constitutive heterochromatin. Facultative heterochromatin can be decondensed and its DNA can be transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. 
constitutive heterochromatin is always present in its condensed form. The facultative heterochromatin can vary from cell to cell and is less polymorphic than the constitutive heterochromatin, which means that it presents fewer variations in the DNA sequence. The constitutive heterochromatin of somatic cells, that would be any cell of the body that isn't a gamete or sex cell, is essentially devoid of genes, is highly polymorphic, and it has very long clusters of repetitive DNA whose sequences are very difficult to obtain. Because of this, Heterochromatin was accorded a low priority for DNA sequencing by the Human Genome Project. Back to Assassin's Creed, this is where it gets interesting. Nowhere in any Abstergo files is mentioned that genetic memories require actual genes. We only know it's part of the DNA. Heterochromatin non-coding DNA only compresses 7% of the actual genome, so around 200 megabases or 2 times 10 to the power of 8 base pairs. There are about 6 times 10 to the power of 9 base pairs per diploid genome meaning there is duplication of the chromosomes, of which about 1.5% is actual coding DNA, and the rest is non-coding DNA. This means that a high percentage doesn't contain genes or scientists haven't defined them yet, so this well could be where genetic memories are stored. So, how can you know to which historical setting an ancestor belongs? For a while, DNA fragments known as variable number tandem repeats or VNTRs present in the heterochromatin have been used as markers to compare to other VNTRs. VNTRs are polymorphic mini-satellites, which are tracts of repetitive DNA with certain DNA motifs, and they are amongst the most mutable regions of our genome. These markers are used in linkage analysis of genomes, for example, to study genetic diversity and breeding patterns in animals. One instance in which Abstergo used these VNTRs was in Subject 17's DNA during the preparation of the Sample 17 project where they used VNTRs to detect ancestor DNA by comparing Subject 17's DNA to specific VNTRs, which resulted in the discovery of ancestors that lived during the 12th and 13th centuries, the Renaissance, and the American War of Independence. In this graph, we can see in white the sequence of Subject 17, and in blue, gray, and red the sequences of the VNTRs of the ancestors. Note the several locations in which the VNTRs coincide. Abstergo may have a database of sequences belonging to specific historical time periods that they can use to compare to modern-day DNA sequences. Another possibility is that somehow Abstergo can predict based on very specific or key historical time points how these VNTRs would look in the past, but that would be quite far-fetched. So finally, in this video, I'm going to try to answer the question how can you know which memory specifically will show you a certain thing? For example, when Altair was in contact with a piece of Eden. It's possible that the Animus runs a preliminary scheme of the genetic memories before dropping the user on a specific one, and that this scheme or search is customized by the Templars or the Assassins based on what they expect to find, for example, by using keywords or descriptions. It's not always possible to synchronize with the ancestor in that particular sequence due to the mental or physical state of the ancestor, so many times this could cause a shock on the Animus user. So it's wiser to go back in the sequence and let the user synchronize slowly with the ancestors so the memories can actually be unlocked and visualized. And that's all for now. Thanks for watching this video. Please let me know what you think about it and until the next time.